John 7, 25 through 48, because that's the greater context of my lesson today. And it's really important that you, you read that uh, sometime today and connect the dots of my lesson. I'm going to look into one specific part of what the dynamics of what was going on in John 7, 25 through 48. He says, here's how the writer introduces us to this idea of rivers of living water. On the last day, the great day of the feast, which was the Feast of Tabernacles, out of Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, where seven messianic holidays, Jewish holidays, are explained. The Feast of, of Booths or Tabernacles was one of the seven. If you have a study Bible, they're probably telling you that in some form or another. On the last day, the great day of the feast, that was the Feast of Pentecost, of uh, Tabernacles. They're on the, 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 the last day of the great feast. Jesus stood and cried out and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. <clears throat> What is interesting about this, is how the water got connected to this feast. We have some of the weirdest stuff go on in this old church. So uh, it's my life right there. Normally, with when you have the feasts that are connected to Christ, when you have the Jewish holidays connected to Christ, the blood is the big issue. The blood. The blood. If you looked at Leviticus, it'll be on your paper, not now, but later, and take a look at the feast called tabernacles or booths, you'll find this. You'll find this true with all of the feasts that connected the Messiah, the blood. He didn't do that. He connected water. Now let's <laughs> look at it again. On the last day of the feast of tabernacles, which was the high, a high Sabbath, meaning it, didn't, it didn't, didn't, didn't depend on the day of the week, but rather the date. And he said, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He believes, believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What did he connect to the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles? Living water. And how would you do that? Here's what he did. <laughs> he connected to the Exodus 17. He didn't connect it to Exodus 12, Passover, unleavened bread, connected to Exodus 17. And we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about why he did that. 
He went on to say, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Footnote is in verse 39. A footnote. A theological, scripturally explanation. But this, rivers flowing, rivers of living water flowing from the innermost beings of a person's soul. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive, were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, meaning he hadn't died on a cross, wasn't buried, wasn't raised, hadn't ascended, and is in session and seated at the right hand of God the Father yet. That's glorified. As soon as he's glorified, the person who believes in the gospel of Christ is going to receive the well of living water within his own being. Did you get that? From his innermost being will flow rivers, will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit, who was not given now, would be given later. We call that Pentecost. That's Acts 2. When, the, when Jesus gave the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a lot there to be digested, dear hearts. There's a lot here to be digested. In Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verses 33 through 44, the historical record and background to this fest, festival is given. Of note to you and I is verse 34 and 35. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of the seventh month is the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles, for seven days to the Lord. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation. That's a high Sabbath. You treat that day as a high Sabbath. Like John 19.31. It's considered a high Sabbath. It's, it's not a Sabbath day. It's a Sabbath date. It's not a Saturday. It doesn't fall on a Saturday. It can fall on any. It's based on a date, not a day. It's called a high Sabbath. It's treated like a weekly Sabbath, but it's a high Sabbath. They call it a holy convocation. You shall do no, no laborious work of any kind on that day. According to our text, what day did Jesus introduce them to the rivers of living water. According to your text, what day? Last day. What would that be? According to Leviticus, what would the last day be? Eighth day. Do you understand? And on the eighth day, you will act upon it as a high Sabbath, a holy convocation. Do you see that? That's really important. That's really important. Here's what the Jews had done with this day. Here's what the Jews had done with this day. Because the last day was a high Sabbath of Israel. The high priest didn't lead a procession like he did every other day. From the Temple Mount to the Pool of Siloam to fill a silver pitcher of water and return to the temple and pour it on the altar of burnt 
sacrifice. He didn't do it on the last day because why? Why, can he, why didn't he do it on the last day? He did on any other day. Why couldn't he do it on the last day? It was a high Sabbath. See, you, you've got, you look, look, I'm not fussing with you. But you've got to pay attention to what the Word of God's telling you. You read it and don't pay any attention to it. You have to really read it and pay attention to it. The Holy Spirit is in your life, the source of living water, to quench your thirst for the things of God. I mean, he's there to satisfy your need to know the things of God. And it takes the Bible to know it. You know what the key word for me is in this scripture? The scriptures. See, you miss stuff like this. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. He spoke of the Holy Spirit that was not yet given, but when he was given, would take up residence inside the believer's life and give them so that they would have enough to satisfy their thirst and enough to give to other people who had a thirst that were in the desert of the world and were dying of thirst, the thing, things of God. Right? I mean, all I've done is keep reading the verses. Every time I read them, there's something, I think, exciting about it. And so I try to bring it to you because sometimes you don't read and just pause and let the Spirit of God point things out to you. And th that's important you do that. John 14, 26, you study the Bible, he teaches it to you, and then he recalls it. That cycling is very important to your spiritual growth and maturity. You read the Word, you let Him tell you what it's saying, you listen to it, you read it, you listen to it, you read it, and you listen to it until you begin to understand it. I mean, a thousand questions ought to be coming to your heart if you've got a thirsty soul. So that's the historical background that's the historical background, one of them. And the other historical background to that is what Jesus connected this to. What Jesus connected to. I'm still in my introduction. I'm on the second or third paragraph by now. It is a historical memorial. It is a historical memorial to God's logistical grace. What Jesus is talking about, about in regard to the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews had made it a historical monument to God's logistical grace when he satisfied the weary Exodus generation who had left Egypt, a place of slavery, and had found freedom and were in a desert afraid that they were going to die of thirst. Exodus 17. Exodus 17. This is another historical point that you've got to get to understand where Jesus... All the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages because there were so many of them. They moved by tribal procession from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and they camped at Rivian and there there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? 
Why do you test the Lord? Hmm? Do you remember that when you start fussing what you don't have? Just remember that. Well, if I, I don't know why, remember that. Their quarreling with Moses was testing the Lord. They were quarreling about logistical grace. You understand that? Well, I wrote down Philippians 4.13 so that you could get it. And then Paul talked about this very thing in 1 Corinthians 10. I wrote that on your paper. Why do you test the Lord, he asked. The people, but the people thirst there for water. And they grumbled and complained against Moses and said, why now have you brought us from Egypt? You know why? Because they were, they were complaining about being in bondage. They were tired of slavery. They were, trying to be in, they were tired of being slaves in the world. Now they have their freedom by the grace of God. God has told them, I will take care of you, and he has proved it with the miracles in Egypt, the miracle at the Red Sea. He has proved to them over and over again that he is their Abba Father, and he will take care of them. But here they are, because they're thirsty, they're complaining. Mo Moses says, why are you complaining to me? Why are you testing the Lord? Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. Why are you testing the Lord? The people thirst. He says, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children, our livestock, with thirst? Boy, there's a false assumption. Beware of false assumptions. They lead to false interpretation, false expectation, and false application in your life. It is so quick to jump into false assumptions, it's unbelievable. Beware that you don't do that. Because when you do, and in regards to what the Lord has promised he would do for you, it's called testing the Lord. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? So Moses complains to the Lord. You know, this is a vicious cycle. What shall I do with these people a little more and they will stone me? They said they were willing to kill him. The Lord said to Moses, pass before the people, take with some of the elders of Israel, some of your leadership, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile and go forth. Behold, I will stand before you there at the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the leadership of Israel. And so the name Massa, which is the root form, is the root of Meribah, which is the Hebrew word for quarreling. Quarreling with the Lord. Because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Here was their, their complaint. Here was their charge against God. He freed us from the bondage of slave, slavery to bring us out into wilderness and kill us of thirst. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to kill Moses. Still want to go into ministry? Huh? There was a reverse invitation, wasn't it? Paul talks about this very subject in 1 Corinthians 10. And so he said to Moses, take your rod, strike the rock. And water, enough water came out of a rock <laughs> to quench the thirst of over two million people. 
That's a pretty good rock, isn't it? Struck a rock. Listen, you know who that rock was? Do you know who that rock was? Do you know who that rock was? Christ. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you not know that Christ is the rock? He's not just the rock of your salvation. He's the rock of your life. And do you not know that it's through Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, His session today, that provides for all of your needs? Here's Philippians 4.19. You should write this one down. I put it on your paper, but who knows if you read it. Well, here's what it says to you. My God will supply all. So you don't pay any attention to that. As soon as they are, as soon as it... it What he will, what will he supply? Some of your needs, some of them, right? Why do you live that way then? Why do you complain that way? My God will supply all of your needs according to the riches in glory, of according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Here's with the sadness probably of this story, knowing the rest of the story of the Israelites. They're going to leave that period in the desert where they were, quote, dying of thirst. They talk like a two year old kid in your house. Oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to have me a Pepsi. You're not going to die if you don't drink a Pepsi. Oh, I'm going to die if I don't get the Pepsi. The problem with this whole thing with the Israelites, they think now that they've got their wish by complaining and threatening. Because this old habit they got is not going to be broken, even though God supplied their marvelous grace to them. They learned nothing from it. Because they're not scripturally bound people. They live by how they feel and how they think and how they listen to the world tell them the way they should go and how they should think and how they should feel. They don't open the scriptures and study the scriptures. What about you? Huh? What about you? Meribah, huh? Maybe we ought to tack up a sign in your house rather than say welcome. We ought to say Meribah. Put that above the front door rather than the blood of Christ. Put Meribah above it. How quickly they forgot that it was the blood of Christ over the doors that allowed the death angel to pass over. Not one person was taken. Now they've got over their door Meribah. 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 What are they doing? They've gone back to their old way of living, which is old man cosmos diabolicus. They would rather live in slavery and have the slave owners give them a little water than to live in the freedom and have God give them all they wanted, all they would ever need.
Yeah, well, I got to be talking to somebody day other than myself. So here we are on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the priest, on the eighth day, the priest is not out carrying water as a reminder of Exodus 17. Right? He's not there. But Jesus is. The rock shows up. The rock, not the high priest, the priest. He shows up in John on the eighth day. He shows up when nobody's carrying any water from anywhere and says, you know what the high priest forgot? They forgot that I am the living water. I am the rock. That high priest carrying water, that's temporal. It's not eternal. When you read John 7, 25 through 48, do you know what the religious leaders were going to do? Their plot, listen to me now, their plot on the Feast of Tabernacles was to assassinate Jesus Christ. Now think about that. If you read John 7, 25 through 48, you will have a repetitive theme. They were going to assassinate him. So when the high priest stayed in the house on the eighth day, Jesus came out as the rock. And he said, you know what these guys, religious leaders have missed to tell you, dear, dear hearts? Listen to me, Israel. I am that rock. I took care of you in the wilderness. I'll take care of you again. I am the rock of the living water. He's more so today than ever. The message of Christ at the Feast of the Tabernacles on the eighth day was a promise. I will give every person that comes to me and believes will receive in his innermost being rivers of living water. It's a promise that's for you and I too. You know what that means? You will always have your thirst satisfied in Christ. You never have to go to the world ever again to have your needs taken care of. You don't, you don't have to go to food. You don't have to go to alcohol. You don't have to go to drugs. You don't, you don't have to go to those places. To find your needs satisfied. If you will believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, the moment you believe, you receive. Oh yeah. See, you don't you don't listen. Listen to me now. Here's John 7. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Listen to verse 39. This he spoke of the Spirit whom they, those who believe in Christ were to receive. If you believe, you what? If you believe, you what? If you believe, you receive. That's grace. It's not works. That's grace. If you believe, you receive. What are you going to receive? You're going to receive rivers of living water. Where, where are they going to flow from? Where are they going to flow from? They're going to flow from Christ. Where are they going to flow to? You. And where are they going to flow from you? Hmm, to the world. He who believes in me, 
as the scripture says, from his innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. Point number one. The tabernacle, see, I had to do some historical background to you. Okay? All right? How are you going to know that? That's my job, make sure you know all this stuff. The tabernacle of the booths, or tabernacle, the tabernacle of booths, was the occasion for Jesus introducing the doctrine of living waters to Israel, rivers of living water to the Israelites, who were in attendance from all over the world. All over the world. When you read John 7, 25 through 48, you will see that big picture from all over the world. And he sent an invitation. People from all over the world came into this Jewish national holiday from all over the world. And he gave an invitation. He said, he who believes in me, let him come to me and drink. That's a personal volitional act. Let him come to me and, and drink. You know what he, he compared to drink to? You know what he compared it to? Believe and receive. Believe and receive. He compared it to believe and receive. If anyone thirsts, an invitation to be saved, let him come to me, the Messiah. Remember, this is offered to Jews from all over the world. And drink personal decision to be saved. The question I ask you today in this session is how does a person come and drink today in this gathering? How does a person come and drink? Listen to Jesus' answer. It's very simple. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. For you, Jesus has come. He's died on a cross. He's been buried. He's been raised. It's called the gospel. When you believe it, you receive it by grace through faith and not of yourselves, a gift of God. It's a gift from God. From his innermost brain. What was he talking about? He was talking about the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Why did Jesus promise to the person who believes the grace gospel? What did he promise him? If you will believe the grace gospel, what did he promise him? He promised that the Holy Spirit would come and take up residence inside, right? In his innermost beings. And what would happen? Would become rivers of living water. What is it they designed to do? Take away your thirst that the world offers you answers to that only create greater thirst and misery in your life. When you go to the world to satisfy your desires, all they do is create more. They don't satisfy anything. They just create more. And the whole idea of the world under the devil system is to get you hooked so that you have to keep coming back to that well that's always going dry. The well always goes dry. The well of living water is forever. It will always meet your need. It will always satisfy you. Always. When you go to the world, it never will satisfy you. It just creates a greater appetite. Boy, you've got to understand this. You're going to get, you're going to get hooked and sunk. And so Jesus has laid out a really good program. His answer, he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe were to receive. Here's the second point. I want to re-examine some key points about rivers of living water that sometimes we miss. For example, the word rivers is plural, but living water is singular. There's many rivers, but only one source living water. 
And what he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. Right? He said that in verse 39. He said, the Spirit takes up permanent residence in the innermost beings of every church age believer's body at salvation. John 14, 16 says, when he takes up residence, he's there forever. 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 Once that well of living water is established in your life, it is forever. That well will never go dry. You can't drink enough of it. You go to the you go to the to the well of the world, you become a glutton and, a, and an addict, a drunkard. You come to Jesus on living water, you lose weight and you look good. I mean, how can you beat that deal? Now, rivers of living water that are established inside your life, rivers of living water flow inside to the outside. The whole idea of a, putting that well of living water inside every church age believer is to make that well mobile. And you know why? Because he's going to send you to all kinds of places where there are thirsty souls that want a drink of living water. You know that? You ought to think that way when you stop your car and fill up with gas. You ought to look around, see if a car pulls up next to you. You ought to start a conversation. They may reach and guard their hip pocket or put their hand over here when you do that. But listen, you're a mobile well to a thirsty world. Do you understand that? You're a mobile well of living water with a testimony of how important that well is to their life. And wherever he sends that well, look for thirsty people. Look for thirsty people. It is amazing how many thirsty people you will run into. You'd be surprised how many thirsty people God will bring to your, your well to drink. You will be amazed. And so we're, we're that water. We're that well. That well is in our innermost being, and, and from it flows rivers of living water. It's not just, that well is not for just for you, but it's for whosoever wants to drink from it. You tell them this well is open, it won't cost you a thing. You don't need anything to take it. Right Listen, here's what the scripture says and you lay it out. Rivers of living water flow in and out of the church age believer's life. They flow out by the message of great salvation to other people who are looking to have their thirst quenched. Write this down, Luke 15, and the prodigal son. He went to the world to try to have his thirst quenched. And the devil tried to change him into the character of a pig. Think about that. Think about where the devil wanted to get him and where Christ wanted to get him. What God wanted to get that prodigal son was into the image of his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know where the devil wanted him to get to? Wanted to change his character out of humanity and into a pig. And let me tell you, that's where you go to the water of the world and that's what will happen to your life. That's exactly, because he's got nothing else to offer you. He cannot do anything about your humanity but to lower its standard of existence. He cannot make you into a child of God. He cannot make you into the beloved son. He cannot become your Abba Father. He can never treat you in grace. He has the attitude and the heart of a pig. 
And the best he could do is to drop everything lower than your humanity was before you went to him and drank. He's not going to upgrade you. He's going to downgrade you. Look anywhere in the Bible and study it. You will find it to be true. The prodigal son is just a clear example. You go to the world and drink. And the good kid you were in grammar school, nobody will know you by the time you're of 25 years of age because you're a thug. You've lost your sense of humanity. You will do anything to meet your need. You'll do anything. You'll do, you will sell out your parents. You will sell out your person. All the P, great P name things in your life, you will sell out to go back to drink from the world. I don't know. Am I talking to anybody today? I don't know. Maybe just me. Maybe just me. You know that well that he wants you to be? You know that well he wants you to be? Right, listen, does he want you to be a well of living water? Yeah. yeah. And where is it? It's inside your innermost being. And your most inner being, wherever it goes, that's where the well goes. Agreed? Right. And that well is for, is for, not just for yours, but it's for other people to drink from. Agreed? Yeah. All right, let me give you a story on it. John 4. In John, the fourth chapter, I'm in seven. We drop back. We actually have a story on it. This is called the woman at the, the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Jacob's well. Jacob's well. <laughs> Who would have known? And you know the story, how he shows up at lunchtime at the well. <clears throat> the disciples go off. They get some... Chick-fil-A, they go up to get some Chick-fil-A, go through the drive through make this thing easy. Go up to Brandon, and he's a sweet guy, he'll help you out. They get the food and they come back. In the meantime, in the meantime, Jesus is at the well and a, a lady shows up to get her water, her drinking water at Jacob's well. This is John 4. And he asked her for a drink of water. And she says, huh. <clears throat> you, know, you look like a strappy young guy. It looks like you get your own water. What's well, that attitude? Wait, do you think that's what the woman's for? Get you water, get this, get that? Besides that, you're a Jew. You're not supposed to have anything to do with me. Oh, yeah, you have something to do with me now. You always find a use for a Samaritan woman, eh? especially if they look as good as I do. Eh? But I know you're kind. Yeah, you know that story, don't you? You should read it. I've added a little bit to it, but you ought to read it. I'll put a little flair to it. So I've got water. He tells her, I've got water. I've got living water that will take care of your thirst forever. <laughs> get, get out of here. What are you talking about, man? I can give you water today that will quench your thirst forever. She says, uh, what you selling, big guy? Well, she says, you know, that might not be a bad deal. Depends on what it's going to cost me. I know you Jews. But that would sure solve a big problem because I have to come down here a couple times a day and pick up water. <clears throat> So I might be interested. How are you gonna how are you gonna get water? How's this? How you gonna give me a drink of water and I never have to come back to this well again? Yep. Well, she said we need to talk a little bit. 
He said, "Why are you interested? Yeah, I'm interested, but we're going to have to talk a little bit because this is, uh, I mean, this is fairy tale stuff here." And they get in a conversation. And he comes around to tell her, I know your whole life story. Oh, really? <laughs> I've never met you before. I know. I know more about you than you know about yourself. Did you know that? Do you know as you sit here today that Christ knows more about your life and your needs and how to meet them to bring back the good humanity that belongs in you? Well, you say, I would, I would really like to know that to be sure. Well, that's for sure. And he says to her, well, go home and Get your husband. Oh. And well, wait a minute, he says. You can't do that because you've had five and the one you're with now is not your husband. She says, well, I perceive you're a prophet. He said, oh, I'm more than a prophet. I'm a lot more than a prophet. She said, well, the only person that I've ever heard of that could be able to do what you just did with me would be the Messiah. Listen, what he did. He went, bingo. <laughs> bingo. You ever played bingo? <laughs> you know, he said, bingo. He said, I am he. And you know what she did? She ran back home and told everybody. You know what just happened? Listen. She's just got a drink from the well. And the well is in her. And she's gone back to talk to thirsty souls. And boy, did she ever. She couldn't stop talking about it. She talked about it so much that the entire city came back to the well. <laughs> the entire city came back to the well. And they said, well, we've come back to see for ourselves and to hear for ourselves about this well of living water, a satisfied thirst. That's all she's talked about. So we come down to check on the well digger We're thinking that. See what he charged me to put a well in my backyard. And there was a citywide revival. When they left that city, that city had been converted to Jesus Christ. Because one woman finally got it right and carried the well back to the people. And they wound up saying, now I believe. That Jesus Christ is my savior. Does that happen to your life? Listen, a lot of people, Israelites and Sumerians, will die at the foot of the well without ever taking a drink. I don't want you to be one of those people today. If you have never believed personally, I don't mean hearsay, I mean personally. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, 
And if you will believe that, you will receive this well of living water that will satisfy the thirst that's driven you all over this world to find something that could satisfy your wandering soul and you have not found it because you have not looked at the right place in the right person of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. He died there in your place to give you his place. He put that well of living water inside of you that will always satisfy your thirst in this world and wants you to carry that well to other people and tell them to take a drink from the well that lives in Jesus Christ so he can put that well in them. So we're going to bow our heads and have a word of prayer before we take a break. If you've never believed that, you've got to believe to receive. I'm going to give you that opportunity right now as you sit there right there with every head bowed and every eye closed. Don't be like me who heard that Jesus died and didn't believe. Be like the Ron Adama that heard and finally believed and his life was changed. You've probably heard the story of Christ, but have you believed that he died, was buried and raised on your behalf for time and eternity? However you want to make that prayer, you make it in your own words, you do it in the silence, you do it in privacy, and you get it done. You get it done today. God wants to put that well of living water inside your inner being to satisfy what you're searching everywhere in the world in the wrong places. That one place is Jesus Christ. You tell him, I want to take a drink of that living water. I believe, and you will receive. That's the promise from God. How do I know I'll receive it? Because the Bible says so. In John 7, 37 through 39, on rivers of living water. <coughs> and we've gone back to a lot of historical ideas about how we were at Jacob's well in John the fourth chapter when we closed our session out. We were at Jacob's well. And it struck me that we ought to understand something really important about it's no coincidence that certain things happen certain ways in your life like they were at Jacob's well when this whole thing transpired at J with the Samaritan woman with the Samaritan woman so rivers of living water in the Garden of Eden It's where we first find this whole idea start, the Garden of Eden. Hey, John, are you playing with those, or are they automatically doing that? Uh, they're resetting themselves. All right, well. Okay. I didn't know lights could just do that. I didn't know they could do all that on their own. Genesis, the second chapter, Genesis 2nd chapter, uh, verse 10, somewhere in there, you've got, you've got a river in the Garden of Eden flowing out. Okay? And what's interesting about this river, this river of living water, is with the tree of life. And that's, that's in Genesis, the second chapter. Go when you go all the way over. This is Garden of Eden deal. That's before the fall. You go over here, and you got the new heaven and new earth. The new heaven and new earth. Now you're into Revelation twenty-two, twenty-one, twenty-two. In twenty-two, 
in the new heaven and new earth, you got this garden again with rivers, with the tree of life and river, the river of life and the, and the tree of life. You're back to that. Okay? So when you, when you take a look at that, and I'm always interested in the bigger picture, okay? You're going to find this. When you study these two things, you've got parallels. People preach on them all the time. The new heaven and new earth. Here's the first one. Here's the last one. Here's the first one. Here's the last one. Now, what's happening in between me is fallen humanity. The human race has fallen. Between this one and this one, we're dealing with fallen humanity. Now, watch how God does this. Watch how he does this. We come out of the fall, and we got Adam. Okay? We go from Adam, just showing you how God, how, how God has now got to establish, how do we get what he started in the garden, what he's going to wind up with over here, how do we get it during this period? Adam gets converted. From his fallen state, he gets converted. And the linear line, this is the line of the redeemed. The redeemed. From here to here, in that between is the redeemed. Now, we have a lineage going on, and the whole life is to get us from there. What do we do in the meantime before we get over here? Now we go from Adam, we go to the Sephites. The Sephites carry the whole idea of the Messianic lineage is being run through the Sephites. Then we get, we get to Noah, and now it's run through the Shemites. They're the carriers of the message. They carry the, they carry the water of the word, and they carry the whole idea of the Mess Messiah. So we've gone from Adam to the, to the Sephites, you know, Seth, Sephites, to Noah and one of his sons, the Shemites, they carry it. God is carrying the message of the Messiah. It's carried over to Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? The patriarchs. We wind up, when we wind up with the patriarchs, here we are, we got Jacob. And we learn something really interesting here, just has been going on since Adam. All of a sudden we stop here, now we got Jacob's well that winds up in John 4. It's a religious well. You might have missed that with a woman. She says, our fathers, says to Jesus in verse 20 of John 4, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, which is this. Salvation is from the Jew. Messiah is going to be a Jew. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to worship. The Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman replied, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. She was at Jacob's well, which was a religious well. 
it was based on a whole system of worship that was different than what was going on in Jerusalem's worship, but they had one thing in common. Listen to me. The Jews in Jerusalem in John 4 and the Samaritans in worship in John 4, both were doing it without Christ. They were both worshiping God without Christ. And when you do, you have world religion. You don't have the truth of God. It's a false religious system. They both carried the same Bible with different slants of how to understand it. What they had in common is very important because they were both going to the world to satisfy their thirst that only God can satisfy. And he only satisfies it in Jesus Christ. And this has been true since Adam. The Sephites, the Shemites, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The well that Jacob had represented Christ. Out of Jacob, came Judah or the Judeans who carried the lineage of Christ. Twelve sons, this is the son that carries it. He carries it, Judah, carries it to David. Now we have the tribe of the Messiah and the house of of Messiah. You understand that? Mm. Tribe and house. When you come to the census taken in Luke 2, at the birth of Christ, the two parents... come from Judah and the house of David are Joseph and Mary. They are of the tribe of Judah and the house of David. Joseph, Matthew 1. Mary, Luke 3. Joseph is going to be from David out of Solomon. Mary is going to be out of David by Nathan. When you look at the Matthew, the first chapter, run to David, you're going to see that it goes through Solomon. When you study Luke, the third chapter, through Mary, you're going to see it go through Nathan, the two sons of David. These two sons of David are going to produce Jesus Christ. We will call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from the sin, and he will be the Messiah. After he's raised from the dead, he will be called the Lord, Jesus Christ. That's how we refer to him. You see, in this now, we have John 7. You see, Jacob's well... Jacob's well, the well was outside. With the coming of Christ into the world, 
He dies on a cross. He's buried. He's raised. He's as, he ascends back to the Father in session. He sends back the Holy Spirit identified in the, in the Acts 2. And the whole book of Acts explains it. And now the well is inside. That light goes on and off anymore. <laughs> I think I just got uh, testing the Lord right then. I should be thankful that I have lights, so I don't care what they go. All right. Did you get that all that? Forget all the lights coming on and off all that business. <laughs> See, that's what you'll write down. I don't remember that, but I don't remember what I spoke about. Have you got that? Yes. So when we have Jesus Christ, dies on that cross, the buried, raised from the dead, that's a big deal. Because without that, he doesn't ascend. He had to descend to ascend. That well is inside the believer, not outside, not outside. You understand that? It was outside. It, it, it visited certain people in the Old Testament. They, they hated the idea of even thinking that they, they would lose it. Here he lives inside us, and we don't even pay attention to it. That's just crazy to me. This is the biggest deal in the whole world. Nobody had that. Now he gives it to everybody. If you will believe that Christ died for you, was buried and raised from the dead, he will give you that. Now that puts the well inside you. All that history I just ran through just to highlight it is for us. The Shemites all of these people, the Sethites and the Shemites and the Israelites and the, all the Elites other than ours. Now the well is inside. And, the, and listen, the lady got it. The lady got it. The Samaritan woman went cha-ching or whatever. Isn't that wonderful? That well is inside. Stop going to the world. Stop, stop going to your flesh and the world to be satisfied when God has already taken care of it. All he's asking you to do is to drink and be satisfied. Quit being unsatisfied with what you're drinking from the Lord. That he's got your back. He's always going to take care of you. He has got your back. And if there was ever a time that we need to be encouraged by that, it is now with this, this COVID craziness. Listen, if it wasn't that, it'd be something else. It, it's, right? Have you lived long enough to know if it's not that, it's that? <laughs> right? We just adjust and we move on because, listen, that's, the world is in transition. It's headed to doomsday. Listen, the most important thing was that Christ came into the world and we are now in the last days. Do you not know that we're in the last days? I mean, the one common theme that almost all churches have is they believe in a second coming of Christ. Now, they're all screwy most of the time about it, but they all believe it's coming. They believe it's coming, and they're right. They're right. We're in the last days. In fact, we're even in the last hour of the last days, and it has nothing to do with signs. We Gentiles don't care about signs. We care about what's coming next. We don't look for signs. You're not looking for signs, are you? Boy, if you want to get worried, think about signs. 
there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be pestilence. There'll be this. There'll be that. Like that. That's your everyday news. It's been that way since the first coming of Christ. Your newspapers are not going to get any better. They're not going to, they bring you bad news. Right? Even their good news is bad news. Well, we only had 48 inches of snow today. It didn't drop in one day. We actually it spread it out over a whole week. Aren't we happy? You want good news? It's in the Bible. Listen, your good news is already in you. What Christ has done for you. What Christ has done for you. And you know what I love about this? What Christ did for you, he doesn't expect you to do for him. Well, I, I bet there's a payday coming. I bet, you know, he, you know, you always worry about somebody who gives you something free. Right? You know, you always wait. They're going to come back and ask for it back or something. Not with the Father. Not with the Father. I love that idea. Well, here we are. All who, I'm at point three. All who believe that Jesus died for his or her sins, was buried and raised from the dead, will receive rivers of living water, which is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Rivers of living, that's an absolute truth. You can't get many absolute truths. You know, that's why I like the Bible, absolute truth. You know what you get from the world? Well, I don't know. It may be, I don't know. It depends on whether it rains tomorrow. Well, it's always going to rain tomorrow. Hmm? The rivers of living water will quench. Circle the word quench. Will quench your spiritual thirst. It will satisfy a thirst that the world can never satisfy, a thirst that the religions of the world can never satisfy. This was Jesus' message to the Samaritan woman at the religious well. World religion can never quench the thirst of an unbeliever. Religious unbelievers will die from thirst at the well of the river of living water. John 7, 38, he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. The Spirit was not yet given then, because Christ had not yet been glorified. In Galatians, the third chapter, verses 2 and 3, Paul asked three important questions. But he was only looking for one answer. He asked three questions to get one answer. Listen to what he said. This one thing I want to find out from you. First question. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Two. Are you so foolish? Three. Have you begun by the Spirit? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Three questions, he's only wanting one answer, right? He wants you to boil the three questions down to one answer. Oh, I didn't make this up. I'd have tried to make this easier for you. I didn't make that up. How many things did he want from them? <laughs> this one thing. And here's how you get there. This is how you get there. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the Lord, but hearing in faith? The answer is hearing in faith. Are you foolish? I hope not. I don't think so. Or maybe no. Do you believe? What you just told me, he would say, do you believe what you just answered? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the Lord, by the hearing of faith? See, the answer is hearing of faith. Do you believe that? If you do, then we shouldn't have any more conversation. 
But you're foolish. Are you foolish to think this way? Having begun by the Spirit, which we just said yes in the first question, are you now being perfected by the flesh, the sin nature? Do you think that the flesh is the place you go to drink? No, that's where the world goes to drink, is the flesh. You go to the Spirit who quenches your thirst, agreed? You don't go to the world. The world won't quench. Listen, the world will turn you inside out. When you look at yourself in a mirror, you'll be a pig. So says the prodigal son. You see, he was only looking for one answer. And you've got to be solid in that one answer. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Is really important because that's whether he stays or not, right? If you say works, then if you don't keep your works up, then you've lost them. That's not true. And yet they were, they were saying that after the fact. Having begun by the Spirit, now you're trying to perfect Perfect. That's works. That's a work system. You got the Holy Spirit system. You don't do the work system. You do the grace system. Be sure you boil this down to one answer. This one thing. What are these rivers of living water? See, this is the stuff that keeps me up at night. I know it don't you, but it does me. This is the stuff that keeps me up. Rivers of living water? I got the I got the what the rivers in plural. So this is what I conclude. <laughs> I am really being tested today. It's a good thing I got a good congregation because these lights are doing it for me. Here's what I think. Here's, here, here is a, a standard possibility because they're connected. The rivers are connected. The rivers of living water are connected to the Holy Spirit, right? Livers of, this is the indwelling Holy Spirit, the liver, rivers of living water. So I ask myself, what do I get when I believe the gospel of Christ? What did God promise me in the Holy Spirit that I could get? And so for me, I get eight things. And so here are my eight rivers of living water that I get from the Holy Spirit because I live in the church age. I get adoption. And these are for you to study later. I'm not going to go back and read all of them. Here's adoption. Romans 8, 14 through 17 is mine. All the ones I like, I put first. <laughs> you can put whatever you want, you know, when you teach. It's fine. Adoption. Every, every person who believes the gospel of Christ, church-age believer, becomes a member of the royal family of God. You're adopted because we're all born in Adam, illegitimate children. The Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 8, and the King James calls you a bastard, so don't get mad when other people do. Well, you can if you want to. But it says, it takes one to know one, you could say. And then you could give them a Bible verse when that top it. That'd be better than pulling a gun. Give them a Bible verse that they can never, they, they can never get rid of. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every church age believer receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit to place us in into union with Christ, right? Current positional truth. You receive 20 status privileges, your clothes closet of new man living. It's who you are in Christ to the world. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is our subject matter, which is the whole source of spirituality in your life. What can conquer, what, what can conquer the desires of your flesh? The indwelling Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Or regeneration. You know what I love about regeneration that's missed? Actually, when Jesus talked about regeneration in John, the third chapter, he says that you're born together, you're born from above. 
Think about that. He calls it being born again. He calls it being born from above. Well, anyhow, for you it would be Titus 3 probably. Titus 3. Sanctification, we've just studied this. We've just studied this sanctification. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. Seals in earnest until the day of redemption. Seals in earnest. Listen, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is sealed until the day of redemption. One day you're going to stand, the books are going to be open, and the book, the book of the Lamb will be opened, and your name will be in it, and it will be in red print because Jesus' blood put it there. No, I don't know about the red print. <laughs> I know the blood put it there. <laughs> I don't know whether it be in red print or not. Don't hold me to that one. Hold me to the fact that your name will be, is sealed, though. And, and spiritual gifts. I'm talking about that on Tuesday. At lunch, if you want to have lunch with us, come 12 to 1. Uh, come in about, they tell me to tell you to come in about 11 so you can eat, but I teach from 12 to 1 on spiritual gifts. It's, it's uh, the Holy Spirit gives you your gift. You don't choose it. You don't choose your gift. That's, you can't, it's not a, you go like, I don't want this. Can I substitute something else? I just, you know? Can I get something other than French fries? Can I get a salad or something with this thing? Can I swap one out for the other? You can't do that. You have to be content with whatever God is. Whatever gift he's given you is the gift that he has placed, composed, and operates. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, 24, and 28 or something. It's in there. You can read it. And spiritual life. I mean, we know these are eight things, and there's there's more, but these are the eight. I'd like to, if I just get you to understand eight, I'd be happy. And listen, off of every one of these, tributaries run. These are the eight major rivers, in my opinion, because they all deal with the Holy Spirit and church age. And off of them come all kinds of tributaries that run. For example, you take... The indwelling Holy Spirit, just for example, uh, he, he conquers your flesh. Uh, he gives you gifts. You know, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, he says there's a difference with him. You're, 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 you're never commanded to be indwelt, but you're commanded to walk and to be filled. See, those are our tributaries running off the main river of the indwelling Holy Spirit. A lot of stuff comes off from that. I don't know. I want to get. I don't want to overload you with so much information that you don't learn anything, right? But listen, if you if you really want to get this, you got to study it. You can't get the, You can't just come and digest it and go like, "Well, I really know that." About a half a minute. By the time you get through an eating lunch and gluttony, you you'll have forgotten it. Let me close. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through His Holy Spirit who indwells you. Romans eight eleven. I love John's characteristic of this in 1 John 3.14. I don't know if I put that on your paper. Probably not. We know we have passed out of death and into life. He's talking about love. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. We don't treat others the way they treat us. We treat others the way God treats us then we know we have been passed out of death and into life. Because in the old life, we couldn't do that. But in the new life, we can. Because of the power of the third member of the Godhead who lives in our life. Well, Let's wrap it up. 
we're going to do other series of thoughts on this subject, walk in newness of life. How do we walk? See, I haven't, we haven't got that yet. I've been trying to prep you. Now we're going to talk about how do we walk in this newness of life. We've got the, we've got the river of living water living us. How do we live in the newness of life? It is that that excites me every day of my life. I can't wait to wake up, and when I go to bed at night, I wait till I'm tired. Then I go to sleep for rest, and I can't wait in the next, I can't wait till my feet hit the floor the next day because I want to walk in the newness of life. And I know it's a brand new day. I know that it's a brand new life. I know everything is up in front of me. And I know God has got my walk scheduled. And all I got to do is walk it out. All I have to do, the schedule's been laid. All I got to do is walk it out. And I get excited because he tells me it's the newness of life. I get to walk in the newness of life. I don't walk in the, old, in the oldness of it. I walk in the newness of it. And that excites me every day of my life. It excites me to see what is the newness of this day that God has for me. But I have to walk it to experience it. He's given me newness of life. But I've got to walk it. When I walk it, I talk it. Because the well is in me. So, Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us by the automobile and the Internet. I thank you for all the team that it takes to prepare all of that. I thank you for Moody. Privilege, Father, to be in Moody. What wonderful people you've given us, hungry for the Word of God. May we be patient in the learning experience and the readjusting of our thinking so that we can be compatibly rich in the Word of God, that we can become of one mind in Christ and enjoy all of the fellowship that comes from that. In Jesus' name, amen.